particle accelerators, machines that use electromagnetic fields to speed up charged particles to near the speed of light, are, at the limit, the largest and most complicated devices ever invented. Used for everything from probing the fabric of the universe to treating cancer, these machines are extraordinarily useful in their ability to control, direct, and study the smallest pieces of the universe. But, being so complex and powerful, particle accelerators also demand extreme care and caution. Things can go wrong. People have been hurt. In 1992, one such accident, born of human error and a critical lack of resources, answered the question, what would happen if you mistakenly put your hand in a particle accelerator? This is the true story of the accelerator accident in Hanoi, Vietnam. Pulsed in a precise way, changing electromagnetic fields can bend the paths of and accelerate charged particles. The first circular particle accelerator, what came to be known as a cyclotron, operated on this basic principle, a proton merry-go-round, as its inventor Ernest Lawrence called it. Modern circular particle accelerators are far more complex than Lawrence's 1930 invention, which won him a Nobel Prize. But the underlying idea of accelerating charged particles in circles to eventually smash them together and against objects revolutionized nuclear physics and has touched almost every branch of science, from the creation of artificial elements for physics to the irradiation of tumors for medicine. The real power of a particle accelerator, large or small, is not that it can move atomic elements quickly, it's that they can move particles as quickly as physically possible. Everybody knows science's most famous equation, E equals mc squared. What most people don't know is that this isn't the full equation. It's actually E squared equals m squared c to the fourth plus p squared c squared. This second factor captures the momentum of some object. In everyday life, we are free to ignore this variable because most objects you're familiar with don't move very fast at all relative to the speed of light, and therefore, the vast majority of an object's energy can be suitably approximated simply by multiplying its mass by light speed. This is the equation that you know. However, when an object does approach the speed of light, its momentum dominates its total energy, and this, combined with a speed of light that is equal in all reference frames, is where we get the universal speed limit, c. Einstein's full equation can be shown to depend on just how close an object's velocity, v, gets to the speed of light, c. But as v gets infinitely closer to c, this factor will approach infinity, which means infinite energy, which we know isn't possible. And so, nothing with mass can travel at or faster than the speed of light. High-energy particle accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider basically prove this. The LHC, the most complicated machine ever built, can accelerate particles to within just 3 meters per second of the speed of light, but no further. 99.9999999% of the universal speed limit, a fantastic feat of engineering. Today, there are an estimated 30,000 particle accelerators worldwide. About half of them are used to insert ions and transmute materials, useful for semiconductor production, and the other half are used in radiotherapy to the benefits of millions of patients, with the small remainder of accelerators used in research. In 1992, a small laboratory in Vietnam was conducting research using another derivative of the cyclotron, a so-called microtron, when a concatenation of design flaws and human error cost a scientist his hands. In the November of 1992, the Hanoi Institute of Nuclear Physics was using one of its two microtrons. The aged accelerator, an experimental model originally built in 1973, was given to Vietnam and the HINP by the former Soviet Union. The machine in the facility at Satin was installed according to old measurements taken in the USSR. There were no Vietnamese language manuals or instructions provided. The control panel for the microtron was entirely in Russian. 
no Russians worked at the Institute. The HIMP's only working microtron was set up to fling electrons through guide tubes at tungsten and uranium targets, producing X-rays and neutrons, respectively. On the 17th of November, the day of the accident, the accelerator was directing electrons at the tungsten target, which would in turn produce a conical beam of X-rays inside of a wooden box that held a sample of gold ore to be irradiated. Typically, an experimental sample would be pushed into or out of the irradiation zone by puffs of compressed air. But on this particular afternoon, the facility director decided that since the first sample was to be changed in just an hour, he could do everything by hand. The first experiment went according to plan. The director and two assistants removed the first sample by hand and placed the second in the path of the x-rays that would scream out of the tungsten at the speed of light. All personnel left the concrete maze encasing the accelerator. Just outside the control room, however, the director asked an assistant to get him some soap to wash up with and, apparently, walked towards the sink in the courtyard. The assistant, passing by the control room on the way to the soap, told the operator that the experiment was ready and that the accelerator was ready to be switched on. What the assistant didn't know was that instead of going to use the sink, the director decided something was awry with the experimental setup and returned to the microtron without telling anyone. He placed his hands inside the wooden box and adjusted the gold sample three or so times over the course of a few minutes. His hands were less than a foot from the tungsten, which unbeknownst to him was emitting extremely energetic x-rays. At the same time, the assistant had retrieved the soap and arrived at the courtyard. The director wasn't there. She called his name several times and then ran to the accelerator room. The door was open. She shouted again. Nothing. Her voice was apparently drowned out by the din of generators, air conditioners, and cooling systems. Fearing the worst, the assistant ran down to the control room to tell the operator to shut down the accelerator immediately. But by then, the director's hands, feeling nothing, had been unintended targets for two to four minutes. The worried assistant and operator turned off the machine and ran back to the accelerator. The door was still open. They found the director adjusting the experiment. He passed by them as if nothing had happened and walked to the courtyard to wash his hands. That's when he was told that the machine had been on for at least a few minutes while he was inside. The International Atomic Energy Agency's report describes that at this point, the director fell very silent. He walked to a room with a gamma spectrometer to check if the very atoms of his hands had been turned radioactive. The machine showed a well-defined energy peak of antimatter annihilations born of gamma neutron reactions in organic tissue. At this point, the director knew he had been irradiated, but not how badly. Over the next few hours, everyone at the HINP heard about the accident, but no one did anything. The director rode home on his motorcycle as usual. That night, his hands felt strange, but he chalked it up to his rheumatoid arthritis. After eight days of inaction, his hands were turning gray but they functioned normally, and an annual checkup two days later didn't raise any questions, despite the director telling his doctor that he had probably been irradiated. She recommended a dermatologist for a possible vitamin deficiency. The next day, his hands were much harder to ignore. They were swollen and painful. Still, the director continued to work as normal. It wasn't until 24 days after the incident, on the 11th of December, that he went to a specialized hospital. His hands were now deeply ulcerated and the tissue was dying. The anonymous director's treatment related to his irradiation would span the next 600 days. How do you build a facility that protects you from radiation while having a machine that generates intense radiation at the heart of it? The most effective and deceptively simple design is a maze, like one you'd solve with a pen and paper, only with concrete. Outside of accelerators and large electromagnetic influences, charged particles and photons travel in straight lines. And one of the most efficient ways to put as much material between you and a beam of radiation is to put as much stuff as possible between you and the source. The hard 90-degree angles of a concrete maze 
both maximizes the amount of material between beams and bodies and makes it much harder for any surface reflections to travel very far. The HINP had a maze around its microtron as well, but notice that where the maze was placed was preventing radiation from leaking into the courtyard and not the offices where the scientists worked for hours on end. The maze principle applies all the way down to the fibers and cables of a facility. Anything that connects a room full of radiation to the outside world, even a service duct, should be oriented in such a way to minimize the strength of escaping radiation, in this case, only allowing scattered radiation to escape instead of direct radiation. In Hanoi, at the time of the accident, cable and ventilation ducts passed through walls in straight lines, and the doors of the facility were parallel, without the recommended bends and lead traps to block x-rays. The most basic protection at a radiation facility, however, is the material surrounding an accelerator or source. Radiation, as particles and photons of any energy, will eventually stop after enough nanoscopic collisions inside of a material. So the denser the material, the better. How much of a material you need for a facility can be calculated using the so-called half thickness which is the depth of some material that will reduce the intensity of ionizing radiation to one half its initial value. The half thickness for concrete with respect to different radioactive sources can be as small as an inch, which is why it's used for shielding the world over. Steel, lead, and uranium are even more effective, but more expensive. The MT-17 Microtron, shipped from the Soviet Union and built in Hanoi without any Vietnamese language instructions, was placed in a facility with concrete walls of, quote, unspecified density. No other details were available. It was later calculated that the radiation dose rate for those working every day in the HINP's Microtron control room, which was never measured to check shielding efficacy, was five times higher than the ambient levels in the ghost city of Pripyat, two miles outside of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. And on the roof of the institute, this dose rate was 150 times higher than that. The news at Vietnam's Center for Burns wasn't good. Later investigation by the IAEA would find that the dose rates where the director's hands were placed were extremely high. 20 to 50 grays, depending on exactly how long his hands were adjusting the experiment, which he couldn't remember. A whole body dose of five or more grays is fatal. Thankfully, because of the directionality of radiation, the director's whole body dose was minimal, but his hands were doomed from the start. The progression was typical for acute radiation injuries, forever festering wounds that defy treatment and refuse to heal. They would get better, then much worse. Within a few weeks, it was clear drastic measures had to be taken. Three skin grafts were attempted from January through February. Two of them failed. In March, an IAEA physician recommended removing the most damaged finger. It was amputated on the 23rd of March, 1993, and sent to a biophysics lab in Moscow for study. A grisly decision, but very useful. You don't often get an irradiated human body part to research. 159 days after the incident, the director was moved to a hospital in Paris. In May, another finger was removed and the right hand was surgically embedded in the director's own abdomen with the hopes of preventing infection and encouraging tissue growth. On day 190, the right hand was removed from this natural pocket. The left hand improved. The right never did. The director's right hand was amputated at wrist level on July 9, 1993. At this point, the director's left hand appeared to be on the mend, but as is the sinister nature of radiation injuries, the damage isn't skin deep. In October, necrosis returned to the fourth and fifth fingers on his remaining hand. By the 443rd day after exposure, both damaged fingers had been removed. All that could have been saved of the director's hands, which wasn't very much, had been. He was finally discharged after moving in and out of hospitals for almost 600 days. The accelerator incident in Hanoi is overshadowed in nuclear history by the most famous accident of the same type, when Anatoly Burgoski accidentally placed his head in a particle beam. In 
It's mostly famous for what didn't happen. Anatoly survived. It begs the question, why didn't Anatoly lose his head when the director in Hanoi lost most of his hands? I believe it has something to do with what is known as the Bragg peak of different kinds of radiation. Protons, electrons, photons, and other particles each have their own interactions with matter. As such, each deposits its energy along the path of travel differently. Anatoly Burgoski's head encountered a proton beam, which deposits the majority of its energy more than 20 centimeters into human-like tissue. Since 20 centimeters is longer than most human heads are deep, the majority of the energy that hit Anatoly did not stop in his brain. If it had, he would have died instantly. The Hanoi director's hands encountered an X-ray beam comprised of photons. These deposit the majority of their energy very quickly before moving through much tissue. The depth of an average hand is within this peak, and therefore, the intense energy of the microtron in Hanoi did not peacefully pass through. It fatally irradiated most of the tissue it touched. This was later confirmed by an IAEA member visiting Vietnam after they placed a fresh chicken leg in the path of the same beam and checked it for antimatter annihilations. It was the opinion of the International Atomic Energy Agency that the accident in Vietnam was bound to happen. The developing country, owing to a serious lack of resources, did not have established radiation protection infrastructure. There were no trained inspectors to tour facilities. The Hanoi facility was built based on foreign language instructions from the Soviet Union. There was no radiation monitoring equipment to tell personnel that, when the machine was on, they were receiving a dose higher than walking around Chernobyl. There were only handwritten manuals for equipment and nothing for radiation protection procedures. Irradiation times for the Microtron had no automatic cutoffs and were instead timed by wristwatch. Staff relied on word of mouth that no one was in the accelerator room before the machine was switched on. The list of faults can and does go on. Quote, the standard of radiation safety at HIMP before the accident was so low that an accident was not unlikely. After IAEA intervention, the HINP fitted a magnetic interlock and padlock to the accelerator room door. An alarm near the microtron that the control room could sound was installed. Other buttons and lights inside and outside the accelerator room were added and integrated as there was, quote, a fundamental need to inculcate a sense of responsibility for safety, a safety culture in all concerned." End quote. Vietnam, by the IAEA's estimation, had prioritized meeting the immediate needs of the country that nuclear physics and research can provide, not nuclear safety. The engineers and scientists at the Hanoi Institute of Nuclear Physics had the highest academic qualifications possible, but they did not have the training, resources, or regulatory oversight to prevent one of the worst particle accelerator accidents in history. As is so often the case in these stories, it wasn't an intrinsic feature of nuclear physics or engineering that caused human harm. No, it was all too human behavior. Guessing the positions of personnel, wanting to change an experiment by hand to save time, assuming that if you can't feel something, nothing is happening. In the summer of 1994, after losing the majority of his hands, the anonymous facility director returned to Hanoi. Until next time.